Hi everyone, my name is Ranjit Nair and I'm the president of Stanley Black & Decker's Infrastructure Business. I also serve as an executive sponsor of our Asian Heritage Network Employee Resource Group, a community that encourages culture, connection, and development by embracing our Asian heritage. I'm honored to be partnering with SAIS, and I'm privileged to be part of this professional development webinar series hosted by Stanley Black & Decker. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is a cornerstone of our company and a personal passion of mine. Across our organization, we firmly believe together we are more and are committed to prioritizing DEI in everything we do between holding DEI workshops, having meaningful conversations, and pursuing ambitious goals to further drive DEI. It's fantastic to see SAFE's commitment to the advancement of scientists and engineers of Asian heritage including this dynamic webinar series that encourages your professional growth and development. Our team is looking forward to furthering our relationship with SAVE, including attending this year's Women's Leadership Conference and having members of our own Stanley Black & Decker team graduate from the Top Gun Leadership Academy. Thank you to the SAVE team for your partnership and on behalf of Stanley Black & Decker, we hope you enjoy today's session. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We've got, wow, 120 people joining us already, and that's fantastic. We're so pleased to have you. Um, if this was a big room, I would ask you to raise your hands if you, this is your first webinar, so feel free to toss up the raise hand. Well, actually, yeah, either clap or raise your hand. That's totally fine, whichever way. It's totally cool. So uh, my name is Parag Matawar. I'm the Director of Professional Programs. Ah, oh, lots of them. Wonderful. Um, I'm the Director of Professional Programs here at SAIS, the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers. Uh, the uh, I want to give you a little bit of background of what SAIS Pro does for those of you who don't have much history with us, and then we'll get into the program. So uh, what we're focused on, on is unlocking the leadership potential of Asian professionals. The problem, as we see it, is that Asians are 50% less likely to be promoted to middle management versus our non-Asian counterparts versus our, uh, our Caucasian counterparts, I should say. This is a challenge unique to Asians versus other uh, other communities of color to get to middle management at parity. Uh, and this creates an Asian leadership gap. There's a lot of untapped potential out there. Uh, we see that there are four common factors uh, for Asian leadership to succeed in this country uh, or in this in, in, in the West. Lack of political and organizational savvy, ineffective communication and influencing skills, cultural deference to authority, and an aversion to risk-taking. To even be able to address this, we've got a few challenges. First is awareness. Uh, a lot of information wasn't available until very recently. More and more studies are coming out showing actual data. Uh, both social scientists as well as uh, just getting numbers from companies as well. Um, that's number one. And so now, you know, driving awareness through programs like this. Number two is what to do about it. Often organizations will approach this as a question of access to leadership content. And in reality, leadership is deeply ingrained. These types of behaviors are deeply ingrained, often culturally. And so it has to be provided and delivered with that cultural context for the for the for the content to really land. Uh, and then lastly, let's face it, Asian leadership development is often not the top priority uh, for many organizations. Uh, and so we find that through SACE, we can bring together now close to 100 organizations to utilize the scale of what we offer and create more programs that to the benefit of all. So that's more or less the basics of what we do. Most of you are likely with organizations that we engage with regularly. If you are not, please do reach out to us at pro at saceconnect.org. I'm happy to get your Asian ERG involved. So with that, one of the programs that we developed through the pandemic especially has been this ongoing free series uh, featuring training partners, and it happens roughly monthly. Now that you've attended, you'll start getting the emails uh, with future events as well. We will post it on the website, the recordings for a few months, and you can stay informed either from our website or from LinkedIn. Uh, this is a uh, enabled by 
our sponsors our, our sponsors right now is Stainel Beck and Decker. So definitely a huge shout out to them. Uh, and with that, you know, I'm going to punt it over and bring my good buddy, Lawrence Huey, on to talk about how to become an effective communicator. So, Lawrence, go ahead, steal the screen. Thank you so much, Prague. Uh, let me just share my screen. Oh. Oh yeah. Wait, let me talk about this real quick. No worries. <laughs> Logistics. So we'll do the, we'll do the presentation with Lawrence. Then we'll have a moderated Q and a, so he and I will do a little bit of back and forth Q and a. Meanwhile, I'm going to be watching for your questions from the chat and we will get to those. So please do enter your questions into the chat. Now, Lawrence, go ahead and take it away. Uh, thanks Parag. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, let me share my screen real quick. And let me just tell you, that my sharing of the screen is intentional for you to see my bookmarks, not because I want you to steal my bookmarks, but I've got a wide screen. And so I know if I do full screen, um, it just won't render the same way for you. So just to let you know, uh, again, my name is Lawrence. I am an executive coach and leadership consultant. And I've spent the last 16 years in the nonprofit space as a pastor. Now, you may or may not know what a pastor does, but I wanted to share that so you know sort of the context for me, growing as a communicator, um, I've had to deliver talks in front of large audiences, small audiences, leading workshops. Uh, I've done it with my staff team, trying to align them with a common direction. I've learned to cast vision for an entire organization. And then at the very ground level, I've written tons of emails. Uh, and I live in Los Angeles, California. And in LA, nobody cares about what you have to say. And so I've learned really how to write emails to get people's attention. And hopefully you showed up today because you read the description for this talk, and maybe that piqued some interest for you. So I'm going to jump in, and I want really for you to be successful in whatever your endeavors are in growing in communication. Um, all right, so here we go. Let me start with uh, a quote here. Just make sure this is working. Okay. This is a quote by Susan Scott from a book called Fierce Conversations. And I want you to really receive this quote. Our work, our relationships, and our lives succeed or fail one conversation at a time. While no single conversation is guaranteed to transform a company, a relationship, or a life, any single conversation can. Speak and listen as if this is the most important conversation you will ever have with this person. It could be. Participate as if it matters. It does. I want you to think about this quote. Instead of using the word conversation, you can basically put in the word communication. It could be any communication. Your work, your relationships, your life, it succeeds or fail one email at a time. It could be one conversation with your manager. It could be a conversation with a direct report. It could be a conversation with a coworker. It could be a presentation you're working on. Every aspect of communication will either move you forward in your career, in your relationship, in your life, or it can move you back. And if you can own it that way, you will show up so differently. And that's really the main thing I want to instill in you in this uh, sharing today. So let me give you a simple framework for communication. This is extremely simple. Hopefully it's oversimplified to the degree of maybe making you frustrated, but simple communication just basically means like person A, the sender, that's you. You have something that you want to share with somebody. In this case, it's person B, the receiver. That's how we normally think about communication. I've got something to share and I want the receiver or person B to understand, receive what I'm saying. So most people focus on the sender. That's you. What is it that I want to communicate? This is the primary question we're asking, whether we're writing an email, whether you're putting a presentation together, whether you have a conversation with a direct report or a manager, you're just thinking, what is it that I want to say? And that's not a bad place to start. It just won't get you to the other side of what we're talking about. What is effective communication? Effective communication is more focused on the receiver more than the sender. It's more focused on the other person than on yourself. So I'm not asking, what is it that I want to say? I'm asking, how do I help the receiver understand what I, excuse my little mess up here, what I'm trying to communicate? How do I help the receiver understand what I'm trying to communicate? 
So there's an assumption there that just because I have something to say doesn't mean that they're going to get it. And that's my paraphrase here, right? Just because you said it doesn't mean people got it. If you can show up with this assumption, just because I said it doesn't mean people got it. It'll shift how you think about communication. We want to be receiver focused, not sender focused. Some of you guys remember the iPhone. It's funny, I call it the rise of humans, even though today it's more about the rise of AI. It's the rise of humans because technology actually made us a lot more human centric. Uh, now I'm an Android user, so don't throw shade at me. However, I want to recognize that Apple has done something beautiful in that um, they created something called uh, really human centered design. Human centered design is something where it's like, if someone were to pick up this phone, would they know how to use it without anybody explaining it to them? I have four kids, and when my first child was one year old, she picked up an iPad. I don't have an iPad, but people have iPads, picked them up, and, and was able to use it intuitively. That's what human-centered design is, the ability to be very intuitive and that it's also beautiful because we recognize that humans actually love engaging things that are engaging and beautiful. Now, human-centered design, just a shout out to you engineers out there, didn't start with Apple. Human-centered design uh, came about through uh, Stanford University in 1958 when Professor John Arnold proposed the idea that engineering design should be human-centered. And then, of course, it got popularized by Apple, right? And that's why I call it the rise of humans. Even when we talk about technology, we're still thinking about how is the user, how is the, the human engaging this? And so what I'm shifting to when we talk about receiver communication is I'm talking about human-centered communication. And I'm defining human-centered communication as thoughtful transmission based on the receiver. Thoughtful transmission based on the receiver. So before even sitting down to write something, before giving a talk, I'm thinking about how would I say this in a way that can help my audience understand what I'm trying to say. You see how that shifts the focus there? Just in understanding human-centered communication is thoughtful transmission. I'm going to think a lot about it and be very intentional um, about that. So I'm going to jump in on what does human-centered communication look like. And here's what I want to say for you. I know a lot of you guys out there are really good at taking notes. I want to encourage you to actually consider not taking notes. There's something that happens when you're fully present and just letting what this presentation is going to engage you with. And my encouragement is, and what I've done is you can always download the video later on. You can go back. How did he say this? What he was talking about? But if you take notes right now, you could miss something. You can miss an insight that's meant directly for you. So I want to encourage you, not as a, you have to, but just an encouragement. Try something different. Be fully present as opposed to taking notes you can always look at it later again, all right? Thoughtful transmission based on receiver. So let me give you an example here. Here's an actual thing that happened, a true story movie popcorn. In the, in the early 90s, some of you guys are probably born in the early 90s, but in the early 90s, a guy named Art Silverman was tasked with helping the general public understand the fat content in a medium bag of movie popcorn. Now, USDA recommends about 20 grams of saturated fat this might scare you guys. A medium bag of movie popcorn contains an average of 37 grams of saturated fat. This is before health culture, guys. All right. So we're talking about a medium bag. We're not talking about a large bag. You're talking about a large bag. That's going to that's gonna send you into like, you know, needing like cardiac arrest. Okay. <laughs> so let me ask you guys a question, right? In the chat, how would you communicate this to your audience? How would you tell the audience the dangers, or some of the issues here? How would you do that? Feel free to engage. How would you communicate that to your audience? How would you put that in the chat? I'm going to wait about 30 seconds or so to see what you guys come up with. Nice. A warning label. Yes. Comparisons. Great. It's a great way to think about it. Show them the mass of 20 grams versus 37 grams. I like that. <laughs> Just tell them, watch what you eat. Really challenging in the 90s when I grew up on Frosted Flakes and Corn Pops. Okay, great. Seeing some really good examples there, right? Changing the tagline, maybe an imagery. So here's what they actually did. 
Okay, here is the solution they came up with. A medium-sized butter popcorn at a typical neighborhood movie theater contains more artery-clogging fat. I want you to notice that. Not saturated fat. Nobody has any idea what saturated fat is. It's artery-clogging fat. Then a bacon and eggs breakfast, a Big Mac and fries for lunch, and a steak dinner with all the trimmings combined. So they really wanted you to understand that medium popcorn had more fat than all these things combined. Now, there is a picture they showed back then. I couldn't find it, so I created my own. All right, someone said visual. Here's a visual for you. A medium movie popcorn has more fat than all these things combined. Okay, this is human-centered communication. How do you go from 37 grams of saturated fat and help people understand why that's not good compared to 20 grams, right? So I cheated a little bit. Uh, I was telling my wife, I'm not just going to grab your normal, you know, um, McDonald's fries. I'm going to look for the one with the oil because that will evoke a response from people, right? It's very visual. Uh, and there's a shift in language. Okay, so you see this. There's a shift in language using artery clogging fat. And then they wanted to compare it. Someone said comparison. Compare to what? To things that people were very familiar with. And they use a visual to elicit emotion. Now, let me tell you, once this came out in the newspaper, sales for movie popcorn dropped 50%. And then, of course, because it's the American public, I'm sure it went back up a week later. Okay, But nonetheless, this is the power of human-centered communication. So how do we do that? How do we move this way? And I believe anybody here can move towards human-centered communication. So there are three questions to answer when we talk about human-centered communication. Three questions to answer. And any one of you can become phenomenal at answering these three questions. Question number one. Oops, where'd it go? I lost it. Oh, here we go. Question number one. Why should I care? Why should I care about what you're about to share with me? Let me tell you, living in LA, nobody cares what you are trying to say. If anybody's ever been to UCLA, there's something called Bruin Walk. And I know in college campuses, they would like have tabling out there for like two weeks. Everyone's like, come to my fraternity, check out my club. At UCLA, it is all year long. There is never a day that people are not passing out flyers and having tables. Nobody cares about what you have to sell. Nobody cares about what you have to say. And I want you to think this way. Because even if the person you're trying to communicate with does care, you're just going to increase their engagement. But most people, this is regardless of your industry, we have too many things going on. There's too many pings I'm already getting on my phone. There's Slack messages I'm getting. There's people chatting with me. Why should I care about what you're about to say to me? And so in trying to understand how people, why you should care, I want you to think about your audience. Know your audience. How would you explain the thing that you're about to explain to a group of kids. I actually had to do this one time. How do I turn a message to, to talk to preschool and elementary school kids? And then I took the same talk and I said, how would you give this talk to a bunch of teenagers and college students? And the last one is, how would you turn this talk differently if you're talking to a bunch of adults? Your audience determines what you might share and how you might share it. So why should they care? You have to know your audience first. I want you to think about the audience that you're sharing with. So the second part of it is describe their characteristics. So let's use an audience, for example. Let's say your audience is senior managers or it's your own manager. What are some of the characteristics of senior managers? I'm going to throw out a few, okay? And then you're going to get to throw some in the chat. You can throw along with me if you want to. Senior managers, like most managers, like most individuals, like all of us, they're busy. They've got a lot going on, Okay. They have to manage up to the directors and they have to manage their direct reports, other managers, okay? They're most likely more focused on people than on projects. And then finally, maybe they operate at a regional level or at a strategic level. So they're thinking bigger and broader and they're asking perhaps different questions than you might be answering, okay? This is just super helpful to get out there. Okay. And you may not have the answers to these. You might not, you might not, I don't really know how they think about things. That's okay. Just asking that question, what are characteristics of my audience will send you in the right direction. And then the last one is 
what are their pain points? Okay. My wife is like, oh, people may not like the word pain points, but pain points are just like, what are the things that they think about, they care about that causes them pain, right? What do they care about? What's at stake for them? So I'd love for you to throw in the chat. What do you think could be some pain points for a manager or a senior manager or a director? It really doesn't matter, right? They're kind of in the same zone. What do you think might be the pain points? What do they care about? And what's at stake for them in general? Throw some in the chat and we'd love to see what we come with. Yes, missing deadlines, not delivering things on time. Uh, turnover, absolutely. Uh, convenience, uh, I would think like efficiency, right? Or is it is it easy to get done? Budget, uh, monetary bottom line, absolutely. Customer perception. You can see how a lot of these things are at the 10,000 foot level. Some of them are bottom level. Did we make the deadline? Do we hit the targets? Yes. These are the things that occupy the mind of a manager, a senior manager, a director, a VP, an executive. That's what they care about. That's actually how they're judged on their performance. Okay. So knowing that you're going to give your presentation a very different flavor to talk to that pain point. Okay. So like you guys said, this is what they're thinking about. How might this, the thing you want to present affect hiring decisions? How might it affect their budgetary decisions? What might this mean for each team under their own managers? Okay. And there's a whole plethora of other things they could be asking, but I want you to get used to doing this activity so that you begin to think from their point of view, not just from what you want to communicate, because if you can understand this, then you're going to answer the question, why should they care? And you're going to present your presentation or your email or a conversation in such a way that you're going to help them care because you're going to address some of the characteristics and some of the pain points that they care about. All right. The second question you have to answer in human-centered communication is, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to tell me? This is the assumption that just because you said it doesn't mean they're going to get it. It's not just, well, here's all the data. They need uh, to know with clarity, what is it that you're trying to tell? Make it easy for them. There's a, a concept in UX uh, user design, uh, which is human design, which is like, don't make me think. And what that means is don't make me overthink. You're the one presenting something to me. If I'm a senior manager, I've got about a bajillion things I think about. That's an actual English word, by the way, bajillion. I have a bajillion things I'm thinking about. And so I have, I don't have the brain capacity to try to read between the lines and all the data you're trying to say, just make it clear for me, make it easy for me. Then I can respond to you better. What are you trying to tell me? And this is where we get really clear. Articulate your main idea. A lot of us, we have a lot of bullet points that you might be used to. That's great. Write out your bullet points. But I want you to think about what is the main idea you're trying to get across? You may say the main idea in your presentation or in your email. You may not. Probably like 50% of the time, 75% of that, you, you may not say that. But to articulate your main idea to yourself, and maybe to some friends, it's going to bring a clarity for you that it's going to shift the way you help someone understand your content. That, that main idea clarity is the hardest thing to get to, but it helps you wade through all this chaotic data and get to that main point that you're trying to say. And you're going to see, as I keep going, you're going to align everything to that main idea, and you're going to begin to remove things that do not align to that main idea. Focus and clarity is what executives pay top dollar for. And I'm trying to help you see how you can get that clarity right now. If you're able to articulate your main idea, you can write out all the bullet points, but what are all the bullet points telling you the main idea is? You got to get clear on that and try to do it in one sentence, not two sentences. Get your main idea clear in one sentence. You guys remember uh, back in the days, I don't know if it was like high school, sophomore, junior year, but we had to write theses, remember? Not theses, essays. Sorry, what am I saying here? Essays, right? But on an essay, you had to have a thesis statement. Now, I'll tell you the truth. I did not know what a thesis statement was to my junior year of high school because in middle school, they kept saying you had to have your thesis statement. I did not have one teacher my entire life until my junior year where someone actually explained to me what a thesis statement was. They just said you had to have it. <laughs> So what I did was I went to the library and I just copied the encyclopedia word for word. Uh, not only is that plagiarism, but it's the most boring and non-essay writing you could ever have. So no wonder I got D's on some of those papers. All right. 
So your main idea is your thesis statement in your email. It is a thesis statement in your presentation. It is a thesis statement in any communication. You may say it or you may not say it, but that clarity will change the way you communicate. Here's the next part. Organize your content into a story. Organize your content into a story. There's a lot of information you want to share. I want you to think of it like a story. Here's what a story has in general, okay? Number one, there's a beginning, middle, and end, just like a essay has. But here you see there's a beginning point. There's some conflict. There's rising action. There's a climax to everything happens, and then it begins to come down from there, okay? I don't want this to overwhelm you, so I'm not trying to get into this, but I want to show you how a story is thoughtfully from the beginning, it comes up, and then it comes down. Whatever you have to share, it actually does follow a version of this, okay? And it's all about how you organize the information. If you just shoot it all out there, it's kind of like a fire hose, right? Fire hydrant that's just spraying everybody. But because you now have your main idea, you're just going to learn how to organize different information to work for your main idea. So instead of this, it may function like this. Hey, I have an intro, right? Like I had an intro. I gave you a quote. That was my intro. Then I gave you some context, which is human-centered design. And then I'm giving you some data and information right now, right? This is easily what you can do in your industry, in your department. I have some info I want to share it with you. And then here's the, like, here's the main point. This is the relevance it has on you, senior manager. These are the pain points. I'm interpreting the data for you. And the climax is, this is how it's going to punch you in the gut, senior manager. You got to know that, <laughs> right? This is the climax where we're like, oh my gosh, I did not know that was what all that data meant because I don't understand data the way you understand. You're the expert, right? They may not understand it. So you're going to build it up. You're going to help them understand why they should care in their intro. You're going to provide some context, give your data, provide the relevance, and then we're going to come to inclusion just in a moment, okay? So I want to see, show you how it's like a story, even if it's not a story. You, it's the way you organize the information that either helps someone to get it or to get lost in it, okay? It's just the way you organize the information. Here are some tools you can use to make it a little bit more helpful so that the person you're talking to really gets it. There's four tools you can use, okay? Number one is you could tell a story. It could be in your intro. It could be anywhere in this entire thing, but you can think, huh, is there an opportunity to tell a story? Because when you tell a story, people listen. When you tell a story, it gets personal. People shift their focus. Somebody who's writing down when you go, hey, last week when I met client A, everyone just puts their pencil down. They start to listen. Telling a story is actually very powerful. So you can think about, is there an opportunity to tell a story in my communication? Number two, is there an opportunity to use simple visuals? Uh, we are now inundated by lots of visuals, and there's a lot of bad visuals out there. So I'm saying, can you simplify your visuals? It's really chaotic if you just show me graphs and charts. They may be true, but they may also be unhelpful. So I want you to think, is there a way to use simple visuals to help my audience understand what I'm trying to say? You might get it, but does your audience get it? That's why the simplicity is really important. Okay. Here's a third tool you can use. Can you make what you're talking about concrete? You guys remember when the iPod came out? My, my kids, they're finally catching up on Marvel. So we're watching Guardians Galaxy 1 because they're getting ready to watch 3. And it's that opening scene. I think it's like the best scene in Guardians Galaxy is like when Chris Pratt is like, he puts on the Walkman. He's like just dancing through the beginning. You guys remember that? Come on now. You guys are Marvel fans, right? And, and he's playing the Walkman, right? And my kids are like, what is that thing? I was like, oh, it's called a Walkman. That's where we used to play music, okay? Now, when the iPod came out, nobody knew what this thing was. Like, how do you explain it? It's like, oh, you know, this is how we normally explain it. Uh, it has a A7 processor at 30,000 megahertz. You know, it has contains uh, two gigabytes. Back then, probably didn't have two gigabytes. Two gigabytes of data and then one gigaram. You know, like, what does all this stuff mean, right? And so how did they try to explain this thing? You know what they said? The iPad, it's like a thousand songs in your pocket. Got it. That's why it sold so well. They made something very, very concrete. Ah, I get it. The Walkman, I don't know. A mixtape, what do you, how many songs you got on a mixtape? I don't know. Uh, 10? 
20, I, I can't remember anymore. That's such a long time ago. But a thousand songs in your pocket, I can jive with that. I want to get one of those, right? So you can, that, that makes it concrete when they're talking to your audience. Thousand songs in your pocket. Got it. Super concrete. So you can think about, instead of just explaining all this data or information, how do I make it concrete so my audience will understand it? The last tool I'll give you is, what's a sticky statement? A sticky statement is something that's memorable, something that's catchy, and it takes work to get it there, okay? So you remember I said the main idea has to be one sentence? You can actually take your one sentence main idea and go, what would be a nice way to say this, right? A thousand songs in your pocket is a beautiful sticky statement. I was uh, chatting with this client recently um, and I was asking like, what do you guys, what do, you guys do? Because honestly, I didn't get it, right? It's like, they do like a hundred things. And so this is the same thing, right? What is effective community? I'm like, what do you guys do? And they're like, ah, we provide uh, leads for uh, financial advisors that need leads to become clients. I'm like, yeah, but you're also like selling merchandise. There's like logos. There's like, like there's like a hundred things you're doing. They're like, oh, it's all part of the package. And so after, after I got it, I said, oh, you want financial advisors to come to you for the leads, but stay for everything else. And the CEO was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to steal that. Come for the leads, stay for everything else. That could be a sticky statement. Now, I don't know. It may not land. They might not use it, but that's super helpful, right? It's like, you're kind of like Target, right? You came for the sale item, but you stayed for all the groceries, even though they're actually not that cheap. But anyways, whatever. So, right, a sticky statement can help people understand, not just in a one sentence way, but it's a phrase. They leave the room going, huh, yeah, we want people to come for the leads and stay for everything else. That's super clear, right? You waited all that information and now they understand what you're talking about. All right. Um, this is probably not very PC, but I didn't come up with it. It's actually a writing advice called Murder Your Darlings. And what it means is it's a writing technique where you have to just begin to trim the stuff that you feel is necessary, but it may not be necessary for your audience. Simplifying and editing is the hard work of writing and of communication. So... There could be like five charts you want to share, but you're like, because it's really cool. And you know, if these people see this data, they'll be really impressed. And you feel like you feel like you have to share it. But as you go through it, you might go, you know what? We could probably get by with just two of those charts. So it's looking back on what you want to say and making edits. Okay. Here I've used some uh, post-it notes for you. Okay. So here, let's say you've written out your intro and you might decide, hey, this presentation is getting pretty long. I'm just going to use a question instead of a story. This is murdering your darlings. But it's a really good story, guys. Like, I'm going to talk about Indiana Jones, and I'm going to talk about this. Yeah, I know it's cool, but, like, we just need to get there faster. Okay, okay, we'll change it. I'll just do, I'll just do a question, all right? So you're editing. You're murdering your darlings. The second one you might do, instead of using five stats, you might just have to, quote, unquote, settle for three. Three is going to do the job, right? Again, it's not for you. It's for your audience. Another one, you might remove one graph right? One slide, you know, the slide that you came up with that took you two hours to create, you miss, you might have to let it go because it's just too much. Too much information is, is overload. Okay. And then here you might have to shorten your sticky statement to a phrase. Oh, but I took me two hours to write this beautiful sentence. Yes, but it's just, it's just too long. So I'm just giving you ways you might have to trim this down. And that's what it means to murder your darlings. Cause it's going to feel like, you're going to feel like you care for them. You're going to feel like, just precious babies that you want to get out there in the presentation, but you can't because you only have 10 minutes and you're like, it's not an hour. Just like me, I'm losing time and I got to cut it out. All right. So I think you get the idea, right? You've really got to edit and trim down and remove stuff to simplify what you're talking about. All right. So answer three questions, right? Number one, why should I care? You got to know your audience. Number two, what is it you're trying to tell me? You got to really simplify and get clear. Here's the last question. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Now, I know not all of us have that position or authority in the room to actually decide what your stakeholders should do. Let me just tell you something. It's okay. You can suggestively make recommendations, but I'm saying, what is it that you would like them to do in your head when you're preparing? You don't have to say it out loud. You don't have to tell them to do something. But you're going to start to write your presentation in a way that is to convince, not just to inform. This is how I do things. Communicate to convince, 
not to inform. Now, I shared this with Prague. Hopefully, this still lands here. But I once did a talk, guys, on the history of Street Fighter. Does anybody know Street Fighter? It was an information talk. There was nothing to convince people on. There was nothing to do as a result. But if I'm trying to convince about something, I want to tell the I want to I want to tell it in such a way that you're like, oh my gosh, the way he describes Street Fighter, I don't know what it is, but now I'm gonna go YouTube it. I'm gonna go check it out. I'm gonna go play it. Okay. That that wasn't like what I was trying to do, but like now you're interested, right? It's going to change what you share. So I was telling Parag that in Street Fighter 2, some of you guys might remember, there's actually glitches in Street Fighter. You can actually get one of the characters. When you're playing another person, you can get to glitch mid-play and actually reset the whole game. Now, you might get punched in the face after that, but it's a really cool glitch to reset the game mid-fight, right? Just telling that one thing about Street Fighter is going to make your audience go, I want to go check that out. I want to check out what you're talking about, right? So I've got nothing to sell you on. I'm not trying to get you to do anything, but I want you to be so engaged that you're like, I want to check that out, right? So here's the difference. If you communicate to convince, not to inform, you're going to move from telling to compelling. You're not moving to selling, right? You can go to the other end. I'm trying to sell you on something. I'm never trying to sell anybody on anything. I understand that nobody likes to be sold to, but what I'm trying to move you away from is don't just tell people compel people, tell it in a way, write an email in such a way that's compelling, write a description in such a way that's compelling. How is it compelling? Because you know your audience. How is it compelling? Because you simplified it and you told a story and you, you're you like in their head and you told it in such a way that it's going to compel them to do something about it. And then you may actually know what you want them to do. All right. So here's the end here. Present some possible solutions. This is like, if you know what is it you want them to do, as you come down from the relevance, right, this is going to affect your bottom line because we're the experts. Here are some possible recommendations or solutions we might have for you. And then you might actually have a tangible call to action. Okay. We would like for you to increase our budget by 500% and buy me a Tesla. I don't know. Okay. But like the more specific you get in your ask, the higher probability you'll actually get it. The confusion is the worst, right? So Click on this button, you know, that's called to action. Tell me what you want me to do, right? And show them because it helps them to think about something. If you just leave it open-ended, they're actually not sure where to go. But if you can present this in a way where you're clear about the possible solutions and perhaps the call to action, the thing that you actually want them to do, the probability that they'll do it increases a lot, right? So that's what it means, right? You're communicating to convince, not to inform. What is it you want them to do? I've thought about it, and here's actually my recommendation. All right. I think we're closing out here. So here's what I will leave you with. Becoming an effective communicator isn't simply about getting your point across. It's about leadership. When you show up in that room with a boss or with a bunch of stakeholders, and you're clear on what it is that you're about to say, and you're clear about the recommendations, they're like, wow, this person... This person's got together. They know what they're trying to say, and they're going to see you a different way. They see you as a leader because now you're leading them somewhere. So again, come back full circle. Your work, your relationships, and your life may succeed or fail. One communication opportunity at a time. I hope you make the best of it. Toss it back to you, Prog. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Really love the flow of that. And, you know, even... Uh, I'm just partially just kind of looking at the software going, oh, that's really nice. <laughs> kind of going, oh, that website, Tome. Maybe I need to look at that instead from now on or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, I had this thing, which I didn't want to overwhelm the audience, but I really think visuals today should be um, should be simple, right? And and uh, I had another third one, but simple and beautiful are things that come to mind, which it's hard to do, right? So I'm not, I don't want to make everyone a graphic designer. I'm certainly not, but I think it does help us because mm -hmm. we're such visual learners today. I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, and uh, especially with presentations, moving more toward single images with the minimal of words and have it augment your message versus uh, the message all being laid out there. 
Um, and again, probably depends on your me medium. If you are sharing the presentation just as information or as a uh, without speaking to it, then you're going to want all the information there. But right. if you are presenting it, then you know you've got to adjust accordingly. So, boy, well, oh, well, one thing I'll one... say, Prague, yeah. before before I know we're going to jump into discussion and Q and A, but just in case people have to log off early, I actually have a call to action as a result of this. Hmm. Um, there is a PDF. I think Jessica might be getting up on there or somebody that you can download completely free, just for your own value. Like I want you to have a tangible tool where you can actually apply this in an email, in a presentation, in a conversation. So we're going to put a PDF in the chat. You can download it and start using it today. Perfect. Jessica, let me know if you don't have that and I'll find it for you. <laughs> but I think, uh, I think, uh, uh, Lawrence, I think you sent an email yesterday. So yeah. or today. I can post it too, if you need. Okay. So we'll get it let out to you. So, um, you know, let's talk about some questions. So, you know, do you have any examples where, uh, you know, it's easier to learn about this stuff with mistakes, right? We all inherently learn about this from mistakes. Do you have an example in your career, in your life, in your whatever that still bugs you to this day? You're just like, <laughs> Dang it, that was a huge opportunity that I missed or something of that nature. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, the one that comes to mind, and I know not everyone does public speaking because it's like, you know, the second worst fear uh, in the world. Uh, I remember I was invited to speak at uh, some some event where uh, I was sort of the young buck, right? I was I was a pastor and was a product of like let's say children's Sunday school, and so they had all these people gather who really invested in children's Sunday school, and I was going to give this talk, and I totally misread the room. You know, uh, it was in the early two thousands. Uh, Lord of the Rings was really popular. You know, like I was so into it, so I went into that. Um, that message that I gave, that talk I gave, just quoting so much Lord of the Rings. And like everybody was like 70 and up in that room. And like nobody had any idea what I was talking about. There was not a lot of engagement. And so I just, <laughs> I walked out of stage just, why did I do that? You know, so I definitely did not, I did not consider the audience when I wrote that talk. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I think the one that still haunts me is a, uh, in my last role actually at Procter and Gamble. I was um, presenting to my director, my two-up manager, basically, and a uh, super important project uh, you know, that everybody across the company knew about. And, uh, you know, I had all my brilliance on the screen there with all the, you know, uh, drawing through the story. And she was like, got it, got it, next slide, got it, next slide. And I couldn't not because I put so much effort into that darn slide that I couldn't move forward. And it's only like, and I almost felt like, felt like it was a, uh, I almost felt like it was, I needed to give her feedback on, hey, I worked hard on this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and in reality, it's kind of like, no, you got to consider your audience. You're exactly what you're talking about is just like, yeah, you need to speak to them and have the information there if they, uh, if they need it. But when they tell you they got it. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Prague. <laughs> Because I think sometimes you've worked on this large presentation, and it's not that the data is not relevant, but the learning, I guess, is like you could have just had it somewhere that if they asked about it, you could bring it up in that moment. Um, but like putting on the presentation, it can also be your guide, right? You kind of get tied to that guide. Like, I can't move forward unless I go through the sequence of slides. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So um, I want to do another one here. So what's the easiest way like you we have this PDF and folks uh, just uh, Jessica will either post it again or you can uh, you can scroll up uh, you know it can be daunting to someone first trying this is there a couple you know primary ones that you should, that makes sense to first start thinking yeah about? absolutely and I think you know for those that are struggling to download it I think uh, you know they'll probably email it out to all the attendees at the end of this so you'll, you'll get it one way or the other I um, that's probably what I say. I mean, I really want to create tools that help anybody get this. And it's hard, right? This is probably a lot of new language for a lot of people. So I would say download the template and use it in the, the, the least riskiest situation. Maybe you have a easy email you're going to write and you might just shift the way you're writing your email based on these tools. So, so use the template. How might that change your email? And here's what I say, before the email goes out, run it by some people that might represent your audience to get the feedback to see if it's working. That's really the only way we learn. We try it. We go, oh, I went too far. Or, I didn't really quite understand this. I get feedback. I iterate on it before it goes out. Uh, and then once it goes out, you're going to see like 
did it make a different kind of impact? And then you'll just get better and better at it over time. Go from another email to another email, uh, maybe like to a team meeting. Because I know team meetings, if you if you run any team meetings, you might just say, oh, hey, here's the numbers today. Here's what I want to share. But like, hey, use the same thing. How could you get them to care about what you're about to share? Well, they already care. Assume that they don't. And so mm-hmm. really working it through any form and all forms of communication will be the best way to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's understanding the audience and looking at it from the audience perspective is probably the first thing that I'd just try and drive into my mind as I go. (laughs) That would probably be the first thing that I would start on. So uh, what if you don't know what the audience actually Mm. cares about? Like, how do you how do you even get started there? What if you're just not sure you're just said, hey, give a presentation to so and so. So. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we're all going to come across audiences that we don't understand. Like still today, like I, I don't know what necessarily pain points would have been for those seven year olds at that, you know, uh, at that gathering. Um, I think for me, there's there's two things I go to. You and I joke like, yeah, you can chat JBT it, which is kind of true. Yes, you can. What would the audience care about and see what it, it populates? I think for me, it's finding people that represent that audience. Actually, in in classic UX research, you know, user. Uh, experience design, they actually have to run surveys by talking to people or noticing those people in that population and make zero assumptions. So for me, what I'll do a lot of times is uh, look for some of those people that represent that audience and just start to pick their brain. Like, help me understand, how do you see this? Even just, what are your pain points? What are things that you care about? What does a normal day for you look like? And that's a helpful way for me to begin to understand the audience. How about you, Frog? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I think you're spot on. Uh, and, you know, certainly when when you're asked to give a uh, presentation to senior leadership, do a little bit of homework with your manager, with your peers, with other people who have presented to them before uh, and get their input on, okay, how'd that flow? What information did they respond to? And just get a sense for their tendencies on how how they react. Um, certainly had I done that with my two-up manager in that scenario, uh, perhaps I wouldn't have been so shocked, so surprised. So, um, in let's say you understand your audience, how do you how do you gauge the balance between too much information and too little information? Yeah, um, that's actually that's a really good point because I think we can lean one way or the other. Um, <laughs> my wife has usually been that for me. You know, I'll run a lot of presentations through her. Uh, we we definitely like some of you who. We all have friends that we can bounce ideas off of. So that's what I run to is just actually just trialing it on somebody. And if they're not in front of you, I mean, here's the beauty is you can actually, and I actually thought about doing this for, for this talk. I was going to just do my own, record it and send it to you, Prague, for some feedback. But that's that's another way we can do it, right? We can use tools like Loom and, and record it and then send it to somebody and say, hey, give me some feedback on it. Was it too much, too little? Now, just keep in mind, anybody who gives you feedback also has that tendency to go this way or the other. So the more data points you get, the better, but you don't have to overdo it. I, I think e- even one to two people is pretty sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. I I think, I wonder if there's also just a bit of, you know, stated up front. It's like, hey, I've got a lot of information here. Tell me, <laughs> tell me yeah. if, if you want more or if you want less information, I've got it here and I'm ready, but just, you know, get, give me some feedback and just being open with it, kind of upfront with it in a sense. You've got to gauge that, of course according to the setting and the audience and the ability to be able to do that to begin with. But uh, uh, sometimes I think we can, uh, uh, we can ask, we can, we, and, and giving our audience the ability to provide that feedback can be very enabling for them too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point, Prague. Yeah. So I want to run over because we've only got uh, about six, seven minutes left. I want to run over to some of the audience questions. So first one from Faizan uh, is, my presentations demo are between five, 10 minutes long. I do about 20 to 30 rehearsals before making my presentation at the main event. The feedback I received is that even though I speak very clearly and definitively, and meaning not monotone, uh, and and definitely not monotone, sorry, it sounds like I am reading from a script. Mm. How can I sound more natural? Nice. Yeah, I'm curious. You can, there is, there is a over preparation mm-hmm. that can take place. Um, so I guess, I mean, my, my tendency is the opposite where the preparation really helps me, but I think thinking about like, what is more conversational? So 
Um, I had a, a client, someone was wrestling with this and uh, this is probably like the, the nuclear option, but doing some improv is super helpful. Um, I've actually had a group of people who did public presentation and invited an improv speaker to come in, but it's actually getting comfortable with the relationship as opposed to getting comfortable moving through content. So that would be my go-to is most likely for the person who asked that question, you're really focused on the content and you're killing it. You're slaying it on the content, but you've got to think about how do you engage the people? And here's what I say, the preparation should prepare you not for the content, the preparation should prepare you to engage the people. So some things I would say is just slow it down and try some different things. Ask the audience a question, play off the question, then move to maybe a point. Um, so less about moving through the content and how can you really be more present with the audience? Slowing down yourself will help you do that a little bit. Hopefully that's helpful. There, there's a lot yeah. we can say, but obviously limited time. I agree. Uh, you know, to me, I get, I have a standard presentation that I give to lots of ERGs, Unlocking Asian Leadership Potential. There's probably a bunch of people on the call that have seen this. It is never the same presentation, even though it's almost always virtual. It is never the same presentation. How I, you know, what points I bring up, what examples I use, what whatever. Uh, and so I think what I would suggest in this scenario, if I was on, is, you know, presuming you are a content master, you've got this. Practice being confident being comfortable, but don't use the same words. And in fact, if you find yourself in, you know, iteration five, six, seven, and eight, using the exact same words the same way, then it's going to come across robotic. Robotic. Um, so that's what I would suggest. So Yeah, that's great. Great, bro. Um, Abhijit asks, what signals can one use, what can one take during a presentation that your message is not hitting the audience? What should you look for? Oh, that's always a challenging one. Um, I think if you're based, like, so for me, I can feel the room. I know not everyone's like, what, what does that mean? I can't feel the room, but nonverbals actually speak louder than verbals a lot of times. So I, <laughs> this might, this might sound weird, but I am looking for people who might be dozing off or on their phone, or I'm looking for people with that weird face or like, what? Like, huh? I'm looking for that. Right. And sometimes I think even throwing out feelers to see if we're right, you can throw a question out to the crowd which takes 30 seconds and see how that bounces back. Mm -hmm. Not everyone also can change in the moment. So I don't want to put that pressure on. If you feel like people are not engaging, just change everything because that's really hard to do. Um, however, I think there are some things like those nonverbals are, are people sliding off their seat because they're tired or, you know, or you want people sitting like slightly off their seat, right. And, and watching you. Um, so if they're just distracted. If they're, you know, on their phone. These are really great signals. Um, obviously you could tell a story. Stories will get people right away. Um, throwing a question out there to the crowd. Uh, there's just different things. Honestly, this might sound weird, but you can even take a pause or you can just call it out. Hey guys, I'm just sensing something in the room. Let's, let's take a one minute, stay in your chairs though. Don't, don't, don't have people leave the room. They will not come back. Just, just stay in your chairs. Let's take a 30 minute, 30, 30 second, not 30 minute, 30 second breathing break. Just gives you time to adjust. What do I want to do differently? Don't feel the pressure of performance. It's okay. Um, in public speaking, they say everybody wants you to win because if you win, they win, right? So if a 30 second break helps you to adjust, that's a win for you and a win for them. So hopefully that's Helpful. Yes, silence is golden too. So if you're if you're but it's hard, right? I mean, you know, sometimes the the crowd is just a quiet crowd. Um yeah. and it's hard I, to know. I think, you know, um, there's a follow-up question to that one. And actually one of the people who's on the call right now is an expert in this, Fabian. So shout out to you, Fabian. Um, uh, expert because he did a session for this on on this. It's varying what how you're engaging the audience and virtually, especially you've got to do that even quicker because you're going to lose the audience quicker. So, you know, even what you did during your presentation, you know, toss into the chat, how would you do this? Um, sometimes using polls and surveys takes too much work. Uh, so we had one presenter who, uh, who would actually just tell people, Hey, get ready to type in the letter Y or N. So get ready. And, you know, when you read this screen, I need you to read it, type in Y when you're done. And he, he would vary it so yep. much such that it would change over time, uh, changed as you went and uh, beyond just the intonation, the silence, this, those types of things. And so uh, virtually, especially you have to 
uh, be even more cognizant of, yeah. of that because yeah, you don't it, get those verbal cues. And it brings up the point of like, um, obviously you can't do this in the moment, but I wonder if it, if the work of knowing your audience and framing in certain ways, all in the prep was actually tested with groups of people beforehand. So again, going back to the prep with different groups of people that represent that audience will help you know, you want to know when a joke is not going to land before you actually tell the joke. You want to, you want to be able to read the room before you're actually in the room so that, you know, when that happens, it's probably like 1% of the time. And then we can sort of adjust knowing that the content is good and it's right. Then we can adjust with that 30 second break, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a good one here. Um, two of them are kind of in the same uh, vein. So Cindy and Cindy Tran and Amanda Slaughter ask, Cindy asks, how do you recommend handling communication barriers like cultural differences or language gaps to ensure your message is effectively received? And Amanda asks, do you have any suggestions on how to adjust communication styles according to the re receiver's culture, i.e. if you're presenting as an American to a group of Taiwanese nationals? So cross cultures, any general recommendations on how to even approach that? Yeah, I, I would go back to the audience. I was watching um, like a TED talk somewhere where somebody actually got the audience feedback and ignored it. It was a Caucasian male speaking to a group of people in mainland China. And you guys know like here, right? When we get vulnerable, people listen more. Mm -hmm. In China, if you get vulnerable, they, they don't value your credibility. So he was going to tell an intro story where he had failed, hoping that vulnerability would pay off. And they kept saying, do not do that. You will lose credibility. He did not listen. He gave the story anyways. And the translator, ultimately, what she translated is, I already told him not to do this. Let's just laugh for fun and he'll appreciate it. So she just ignored him, right? And so it's hard to know for every culture, but getting that up front of like, hey, tell me more about like the Taiwanese audience. Would they appreciate what we call lowering the wall, the vulnerability up front? Or would they appreciate hey, I'm a decked out six-star general and I've, you know, done this. Like that that's to me, the best way is if you don't know, how can you find out more about your audience? Um, and I think that can transcend obviously not just cultures, but anybody you're talking to. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, I honestly, I've never thought about it. I haven't uh, in my 20 year career at Proctor, I was largely internal to the US. And so I haven't actually had to, to deal with that so much. So I was very curious what you were going to say as well. Uh, of course, you know, if we've got some folks in the in in the room who have some tips as well, please do feel free to toss that into the chat uh, with it. Um, let's see. Um, Denise asks, Denise Shinto asks, what are some things we should do or avoid to ensure there is no miscommunication between parties? So any common drivers that result in that miscommunication? That's a great question. I would, you know, I think especially on a point where we think, I would anticipate first, you know, where are those areas and ask them to repeat it back. Here's, you know, if it's a one on one conversation, it makes it a little easier to do that. So in a group type of conversation, when you're giving a presentation, highlight the key takeaways at the very end so that they that's what's in their mind, what's in their in what the image that's stuck in their head as they're walking away. Um, but so I, I think con context probably drives this a little bit um, as, as far as how to approach that. Um, and then another thing, I suppose, you know ask afterwards if you're if you got a weird feeling you know right. ask is like hey okay just so we're on the same page either within the group or the if the vibe is off then outside of that follow-up or yeah yeah i i know sometimes in the prep there's an example or there's a story that can feel like you, you know just have those moments where like ah uh, this could land but I'm, I'm trying to say this part of it not this mm -hmm. part of it and I think that's where I just run it through an audience like, hey, how would you take this? And this is where I have to make that choice. Do I just murder my darling and come up with a different example? Um, or I just want to be really crystal clear. And then to your point, Brock, throw it back to the audience. Hey, I, I chose to share this example. How are you experiencing it? What are you hearing from it? Um, honestly, though, I guess the big picture thing is like you, you do your work. And at the end of the day, we have to be OK that that does happen. There's just the goal is not perfection. And I think the goal is to own it. Like there could be feedback from you guys from my presentation that I did not intend, even though I did work on it. Um, and I, you know, did all the things I talked about. 
and I think I just have to own it. Like, I'm, I'm really sorry that they came across that way um, and, and just own that and then be able to rearticulate it. So it does happen even for the best, to be honest. Great tips. Lawrence, before I let you go, um, I'm not sure that we even talked about what you do. Like, what do you do? What What's your specialty? What are your, <laughs> what, like, Good. what should people go to you for? Yeah. So I do want to answer one question before I get there, because I saw one question that that was beautiful, which is any tips for organ organizing the information? It was that part when I was saying organizing information into a story. I will say that's a hard part for me. So here's here's the hack, guys. Get all your thoughts out there. That's it. So you'll see in my template, I'll, I'll, I ask you, what are your main bullet points? I put six slots, but you can keep going because the more you're able to get all your thoughts out there onto a piece of paper or onto a document, then you know how you can reorganize it, right? They're like Lego pieces. How do you want to build the thing? You don't know unless you put all your thoughts out there. So let, let yourself just go crazy freestyle. The more you get it out of yourself, the more you go, ah, I don't want that. That should go here. That's really how it works. And you just get better gotcha. at it over time. So I wanted to so, address that. Jessica, go ahead and fire out the feedback because I know we're at the hour. Folks, there are three questions in this as you, if you can, please, please, please give us some feedback. And Lawrence, go ahead and answer the original question that I, yes. the, the question that I had for you, because, you know, I want, I want people to know how to reach out to you. I appreciate if, uh, it. They have more questions. Yeah. So uh, I do two things. Uh, they're related. One is I'm an executive coach. So help high level leaders uh, get to that next level, both in their personal life and in their professional life. I want them to dream bigger than they've ever dreamed possible. I want them to see what they're capable of and, and I want them to be a great leader. So I want them to achieve their dreams in their personal life and know that they can accomplish their professional goals, as I say, without killing them and their family. So that's one thing I do on the coaching end. The second part is I'm a leadership consultant consultant. And that's just a big way of saying I help teams get better. And so uh, I use a lot of leadership frameworks to work on self-awareness, uh, to work on um, self-awareness. I'm now I'm blanking. Uh, leadership, <laughs> leadership development. Uh, and I'm already forgetting the other one, but <laughs> helping teams and leaders get better through powerful leadership frameworks. So if your team is struggling, as all teams are, uh, we help you get better by basically growing in your leadership. And what happens is people just tend to get promoted, which is a beautiful byproduct. Wonderful. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, real quick for everyone else, we have published our next uh, webinar, The Global Asian Leader. Uh, Simmer Singh is going to talk through CCL, which is the Center of Creative Leadership's uh, research regarding uh, regarding leadership and the different facets, along with, you know, what are some of the Asian traits that are actually really good in this context that we actually need to evolve toward? It'll be a fascinating conversation in a month. Uh, that registration link is, is available and Jessica will probably toss it in the chat as well. Uh, lastly, uh, well, actually this one is sold out, our Top Gun Leadership Academy with Nikhil Paul. Uh, it's a eight week program for new Asian manager or new managers of others uh, of Asian heritage. We will be offering this at least once or twice next year. If your organization is interested in this, please do reach out to me and I'll, I'm happy to get you involved. Lastly, our biggest event of the year is our national convention coming up in October. Lots of information will come on this for from LinkedIn, uh, as well as through our Asian ERGs. Please do pencil or pen it in actually. Yeah, please mark it in with Sharpie on your calendar, uh, be there. Uh, it will have 600 plus, maybe 700 plus Asian professionals on site with lots of trainers and lots of great content. So I really look forward to bringing more information to all of you and your ERGs. So with that, you know- I'll be at the followers. National Convention as well if you we want to hang out. Uh, he will and Jim will and Fabian will, uh, lots of trainers that are on right now. So, uh, and I will too. So with that, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate all of your engagement over here. And we had a wonderful turnout. Hope you got a ton out of this. Thank you, everybody.